God of love, you show us that love drives out fear. Amidst the presence of terrorism and hindrances to peace building, we are asking you to make us more courageous to strive to achieve peace, even in fear, knowing that your love conquers all. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Saint Maximilian Colby, pray for us. Good morning, friends and colleagues. Welcome to the second day of our conference. In the two webinar sessions today, we hope to listen to our invited speakers discuss the theme on peace building and anti-terrorism law, contributions, and ongoing challenges. That's in the morning. And in the afternoon session, the speakers will talk about the theme on youth leadership and social media in the context of COVID-19. I want to thank our main conference partner, Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammen Arbeit, GIZ. I also welcome to our conference today professors, learners, lawyers, and representatives from the different sectors of our society from Butuan and elsewhere. We hope that today we will have a fruitful discussion as I encourage you to engage our speakers in a critical dialogue. Good day and God bless. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the Mindanao Peace Studies Conference 6 of Father Saturnino Urius University. This is in partnership with Doce Chichal Shah for Internationally, Suza Menorbite, or GIZ. I am Zinaida Azura, and I am your facilitator this session. We wish to acknowledge our participants from various government and non-government agencies, NGOs, community organizations and offices, religious organizations, as well as those coming from the academe, from the state universities and colleges, the private higher education institutions, SEAP schools, and the Department of Education who are joining with us this morning. Thank you for being with us. We also acknowledge the speakers who will be introduced later according in a while. The theme for this morning session, P 
peace building and anti-terrorism law contributions and continuing challenges we will now proceed to the presentation to facilitate the seamless flow in the online conference let us follow the following session rules all participants are encouraged to mute their microphones by the start of every session the organizer also reserves the right for this action for documentation all the proceedings of the conference shall be recorded and pictures will be taken during the sessions to ensure proper recognition participants are encouraged to indicate their organization's acronym before their names upon signing in at this point may i turn you over to the session moderator reverend father james michael abelianosa Good morning, everyone. My name is Father Michael Bilinosa from the Safalor Sacrino Urios University here in Butuan City. I am the moderator for this session. Here are the discussion overview and mechanics for this session. Each speaker is given 20 minutes for his or her presentation. When each speaker's time is up, we will immediately proceed to the next presenter. After all the presentations, a short panel discussion shall follow, and then an open forum. For our Zoom, for the open forum rather, uh, the Zoom participants may write their questions in the chat box. For those of you who are participating through Facebook and YouTube Live, you may likewise write your questions in the comment section. The Secretariat will keep track of your questions and will forward those questions to us here. You may ask one direct, concise question, and if needed, one follow-up question. There will be documenters who will record the process and uh, questions raised for this session. May I now introduce to you our three speakers, whose bio notes are truly impressive. All of them are lawyers, and they are holding important positions in the country. I start with our first speaker. Our first speaker is from Butuan City. Tal Gidine nga Butuan nun. He is currently first district representative, Butuan City, Las Nieves, Agusan del Norte. He has consistently championed legislations for the environment, for human rights, for the rule of law, poverty alleviation, transparency and accountability and people's participation in governance and he has principally authored measures in these areas he was butuan city councillor from 2007 to 2010 and he was butuan city vice mayor from 2010 to 2013 fellow peacemakers and peace builders may i present to you the Honorable Lawrence H. Fortun. Mm. Can I start now? Yes, Congressman, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, Madyong ay naat ka na itong tanan. Uh, FSU President Father John Young, uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs, Father Randy uh, Ochige, 
fellow panelists, General Cedric Train and uh, Legal Education Board Commissioner Josephe Surera T, uh, participants to this conference, Majong Aina at Kanidyo Matanan. Allow me first and foremost to thank uh, Padre Saturnino Urius University for inviting me to be one of the speakers in the sixth Mindanao Peace Studies Conference. I am truly humbled by this opportunity to share some insights relative to our continuing efforts for lasting peace in Mindanao. And more importantly, for this wonderful location to learn from the more learned and experienced speakers and resource persons of this panel. There may be some varying positions on certain issues, but uh, without doubt, at the end of the day, we all want to be able to build consensus and work together in the pursuit of our common aspirations as a people. Lasting peace has been an elusive dream for Mindanao. There have been, over the years, diligent and conscientious efforts, not only on the part of the government, but also quite considerably, the civil society, the academe, the church, and other institutions and organizations working for the empowerment of vulnerable sectors and local communities. While there may, be, there may have been important milestones resulting from these efforts, that dream of genuine peace still eludes us due to many other factors such as poverty, inequality, neglect, lack of opportunity, corruption, and abuse. These social ills still continue and breed discontent and desperation among our people, especially the marginalized. And these sad realities not only impede peace initiatives, but worse, even plow fertile grounds for perpetrators of terrorism to thrive. Thus, the fight against terrorism should encompass a whole gamut of policies and strategies that should include, on top of military and law enforcement solutions, addressing the socio-economic issues that make poorer communities unwitting prey to the deceptive promises of terrorist ideologies. We all want to end terrorism. Terrorism strikes at the very core of our democracy. Its activities are aimed at wrecking our democratic institutions and destroying rule of law and human rights. Acts of terrorism destabilize our leg legitimately constituted government, undermine peace, security, and order, frustrate social and economic progress, weaken pluralistic civil society, and impact directly on the enjoyment of fundamental human rights, such as our right to life, liberty and property. The high social and economic costs of terrorism to the country is most felt in Mindanao. For decades, Mindanao has had the ominous reputation, both domestically and internationally, as a haven for terrorists. The precarious human security environment of Mindanao, characterized by imminent threats to life, liberty and security, has taken injurious toll on the island's vast potentials and dimmed its prospects for development for several years. Loss of lives, damage to property, absence of economic opportunities, violence, and deepening tension between Muslims and Christians continue to be the pictures that paint certain parts of Mindanao. Even amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, ongoing extremist ideological activities in South Mindanao, and the recent bombings in Holo demonstrate that the terror threat in the country has not waned. All of these indicate the urgent need for a holistic counter-terrorism program, which should cover not only purely military solutions, but also socio-economic strategies that treat the ills that terrorist organizations take advantage of and thrive on. As earlier said, terrorism impacts directly on the enjoyment of basic human rights, primarily the right to life and liberty. Under the UN Declaration of Human Rights, these are combined with the right of a person to security. The security of the individual is a fundamental human right, and the protection of individuals is an essential mandate of government. The state therefore necessarily assumes the obligation to pursue measures to protect the human rights of its people from terrorist attacks and bring terrorists to justice. Part of this right is the introduction and execution of laws, 
on effective systems of criminal justice and law enforcement enforcement to curb criminality, prosecute crimes, including acts of terrorism, and prevent recurrence of these forms of violence. It is the right and duty of the state to protect individuals whose lives are threatened or at risk from criminal elements, including terrorists. And only recently, but quite hastily, the Philippine Congress, supposedly, supposedly pursuant to this mandate of the state, enacted Republic Act number 11479, or the Anti-Terrorism Act in 2020, which the President signed into law last July 3. Public support is imperative for the fight against terrorism to succeed. It is thus important that measures taken by government to combat terrorism enjoy the approval of the public. This includes laws such as the Anti-Terrorism Act, which the people should perceive to have been put in place in their best interests. Favorable public opinion and support should serve as important drivers behind counter-terrorism efforts of government. This means that wider consultation and participation of key sectors and stakeholders are made an integral part in the crafting of legislations and policies. This inclusive process ensures that people and communities will not only be mere spectators, but active participants in government's anti-terrorism undertakings. Civil society participation, for instance, has proven to be of significant contribution to the education and empowerment of marginalized sectors and building community resilience, which are crucial in the battle against terrorism. A civil society has been at the forefront of efforts to prevent conditions prone to terrorism. It is critical that our policies ensure and not hamper, much less curtail their free and continued involvement. It is thus important that at the core of anti-terrorism initiatives should be the preservation and protection of rights that are key to civil society, such as freedom of expression, freedom of association, and freedom of assembly. Lessons from other countries teach us that there has been a good number of security and anti-terrorism legislations and policies that have resulted in the impairment of fundamental human rights that these measures supposedly sought to protect. In certain countries, the hastened passage of their counter-terrorism laws at the expense of inclusive consultations have pre precipitated adverse repercussions to civil liberties and human rights. Counter-terrorism laws ought to recognize the inseparable interconnection of security and human rights and ensure that respect for the rule of law and human rights is at the heart of anti-terrorism policies and strategies. Otherwise, these laws might defeat rather than serve the very spirit of their enactment and give rise to unwelcome circumstances conducive to the spread of terrorism. Several legal and constitutional, constitutional challenges have been raised against the Anti-Terrorism Act. These issues have been raised in several petitions filed and now pending before the Supreme Court. I will no longer delve on each of these uh, issues in detail, but cite only some that are common to the petitions. Most, if not all, petitions cited the following. Number one, that the law provides for an overly broad and vague definition of terrorism that includes engaging in acts intended to endanger a person's life or cause damage to public property and critical infrastructure. Number two, that the law allows detention of 14 days, extendable by another 10 days without any judicial charge, a latitude given to the Anti-Terrorism Council so wide that even the courts of justice don't have. Petitioners say this runs counter to the constitutional guarantee against unlawful arrest and unreasonable searches and seizures provided for under Article 3, Section 2 of the 1987 Constitution. It likewise violates, according to petitioners, Article 7, Section 18, that allows only a detention without judicial charge of a maximum of three days in times when the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus 
is suspended. The law includes an offense called inciting others through speeches, writings, proclamations, emblems, banners, and other representations tending to incite terrorism. Petitioners say this could be unduly utilized as a weapon to curtail dissent, freedom of the press, and of expression, and to address of grievances. This is violative of Section 4, Article 3 of the 1987 Constitution. The law gives the ATC the power to designate individuals as terrorists or organizations as terrorist groups. Individuals and groups so designated shall be published and subjected to curtailment of movements, including restrictions under the anti-money laundering law, even before they are given the opportunity to refute the designation. This provision, according to petitioners, is violative of the due process and a usurpation of the power of judicial determination. These are just some of the many constitutional issues raised against the Anti-Terrorism Act. The legal debates are now in the arena of the Supreme Court, but what do these issues mean to the ordinary individual, to the public, to the communities, to civil society? The law could be repressive against lawful nonviolent activities of civil society and cause-oriented groups. The fundamental rights and freedoms of expression and opinion, association and assembly may be restricted. Rights to privacy may be violated. Right to life, liberty, and property may be threatened. Dissent and criticism against government authorities may be curtailed. The introduction and enforcement of such measures that may result in the restraint of basic human rights and civil liberties will undoubtedly send chilling effect on democratic space. The Anti-Terrorism Act is a human security measure. It ought not create a sense of insecurity among the people whose security is the state's right and duty to protect. As earlier stated, public opinion and support, and support serve as drivers behind efforts of government to stop terrorism. Hence, it is incumbent upon the legislature to introduce an anti-terrorism legislation that merits the approval and support of the public. The faithful observance of a regular and standard digestive process consistent with the rules certainly contributes to the integrity and trustworthiness of a legislative measure. On the contrary, a departure from the rules and a rushed and railroaded passage of a law essentially casts doubts thereon and taints its credibility. I am a member of the House of Representatives and I do not wish to tarnish its reputation. It is a dynamic lower chamber of the legislature that has crafted and passed legislations that created positive impact on the lives of Filipinos. But let me talk about what happened in the House in the case of the then anti-terrorism bill. This is important as we talk about the continuing challenges of the anti-terrorism law. There were a number of different versions of anti-terrorism bills in the House of Representatives. All of these were arbitrarily set aside to give way for the quick approval of the Senate version. That was quite irregular. When similar bills with differing provisions are referred to a committee, a technical working group composed of the authors and resource persons is normally created to reconcile the conflicting provisions and come up with a substitute bill. The committee opted not to observe that and took hook, line, and sinker the Senate version. On second reading, debates were limited on the floor. As we were already in the middle of the pandemic, physical attendance was strictly regulated and only 25 were allowed in the plenary, most of whom were members of the majority. On third and final reading, the results of the voting were quite telling. Many of us, including the media, may not have taken notice of this, but the numbers are interesting. 302 was the recorded combined attendance in both plenary and Zoom. For those on Zoom, voting could be done simply by posting their votes on the chat box or texting their votes to a designated cell phone number or sending them 
to a House Viber group. Despite the convenience of the voting process, only 167 or just 15 over the simple majority of 152 voted in favor of the bill. 36 of us voted no. And for the first time in my three terms as member of the House, I saw this shocking number of abstentions. 33 abstained. A staggering 66 did not vote. And a good number of the 167 who voted in the affirmative made of record that they were voting yes with serious reservations. Certain authors and co-authors withdrew their authorships and co-authorships. And the following day, eight representatives wrote the committee on rules to have their affirmative votes changed to abstention and three to change their yes votes to no. And more representatives wanted their yes votes changed to either abstention or no in the couple of days that follow. Although these were no longer technically allowed after the third and final reading, the fact is, if not for the technicality, the bill had actually lost majority support in the House. It is safe to surmise that had it taken two more days of floor deliberations, the measure could not have been approved in its present version. This is not quite expected of the House of Representatives, where the majority is already called the super majority because of the enormity of their number. There are only 25 of us in the minority, probably the smallest since the time of President GMA. Outside the halls of Congress, people around the country expressed opposition and held rallies despite the threat of COVID-19 transmission in big crowds. And in the Supreme Court, there are by now 37 petitions praying for the declaration of the law unconstitutional. I do not know of any law that has been confronted with such number of petitions questioning its validity and constitutionality in the Supreme Court. Sa ating kasaysayan, ito na yata ang pinakamaraming petisyon laban sa isang batas na naihain sa Korte Supremo. All of these, the unusually accelerated passage, the affirmative votes barely making the required number, the unprecedented number of abstentions, the non-voting of nearly one-fourth of the members present, the withdrawal of uh, principal authors and co-authors, the withdrawal of yes votes, the protests outside the halls of Congress and the record number of petitions against the law pending in the Supreme Court all cast doubt on the integrity and trustworthiness of the Anti-Terror Act. These circumstances and events do not foster confidence and should be a reason for concern on the part of government. We would like to believe that government in pushing for the passage of this measure only had the best interests of the country and the Filipino people in mind. Such being the case, it ought to be open to reforms in the light of these legitimate concerns expressed by the public. The Anti-Terror Act is presented as a measure of peace building. It should be a welcome law to the public especially groups and individuals involved in peace building initiatives. The law is however confronted with several challenges that cast doubt on its integrity, validity and constitutionality. The crux of these challenges is the fear that the ambiguity of certain provisions, the wide latitude given to authorities and the removal of constitutional parameters for law enforcement expose the law to abuse and might impair constitutionally guaranteed rights and freedoms. It thus becomes an overhanging challenge how to reassure and convince an already frightened public to trust and support what to them is a chilling law. The cases pending in the Supreme Court continue to cast doubt on the law's constitutional viability. Pending resolution by the High Tribunal with the promulgation of the implementing rules and regulations authorities will now proceed with the implementation of the law. In the course of such implementation, will the fear of violation of human rights and curtailment of cherished freedoms prove legitimate and well-grounded? Will government authorities be able to allay these fears by demonstrating that they are able to strike that desired balance 
between combating terrorism and preserving civil liberties. As doubts persist, will government be open to revisit the law and encourage wider consultation to introduce the needed reforms to make the measure acceptable to the public and merit their unequivocal support. These are challenges affecting peace building in the light of the new anti-terror law. Vital to this is the readiness and openness to learn from the experiences and insights of civil society and local communities that have been our long-standing partners in efforts to create social, political, and economic conditions that will quell terrorism at its roots. Essentially, this requires a paradigm shift towards policies and strategies that cure the ills that breed terrorism, such as corruption, poverty, inequality, lack of opportunity, and abuse of power. The fight against terrorism should be everybody's cause. It is the mandate of the state to create that environment that fosters active participation of a pluralistic civil society and empowered local communities and citizens. The challenges may be great, but again, with strong public support, they certainly are not insurmountable. Thank you and good morning. Thank you very much, Representative Fortun, for your presentation. At this point, we shall now proceed to our second speaker for this session. Our second speaker is a native of San, Fran San Jose de Buena Vista in the province of Antique. At 1984, he became a police cadet at the Philippine National Police Academy. And from there on, in the last 36 years, served in different capacities and leadership positions in all parts of the country. He has pursued advanced studies here in the country as well as abroad. He has received various awards and in, he retired in 2019 and currently serves as Vice President for Academics of the Philippine Public Safety College. Fellow peace builders, I now present to you our second speaker, Police Major General Cedric G. Train. Sir. Thank you very much, Father. Um, I think you will be you know, sharing my presentation. Good day, uh, everyone. Uh, First of all, I would like to acknowledge the organizers and the host for the Mindanao Peace Studies Conference. I would like to recognize Father Jan Young and Father uh, Randy Ochike from the Father Sartomino Orioles University. Hello, and sir. I would like to, uh, um, hello, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sir, uh, can you turn on your camera, po? Hi, okay na po. Yes, we can see you now, sir. Yeah. Good day, everyone. Uh, likewise, I would like to greet and recognize the presence of our subject matter experts uh, who have uh, spared their uh, precious time to be with us today. Uh, sir uh, Bong Lawrence Fortun, the first district of Agusan del Norte and Bulan City, and uh, Sir Dil P of the, the Legal Education Board. I will not attempt to delve into the legal technical appraisal of the anti-terrorism law because that was uh, expertly presented by uh, Sir uh, Lawrence. It is most convenient for me to share my thoughts from uh, the perspective of a public safety practitioner. Next slide. I would like to emphatically describe uh, public safety as an integrated and holistic pursuit of general welfare to enhance and sustain the quality of life for all uh, Filipinos. A traditional definition of public safety would relate to the functionality of the police, jail, and fire, and uh, 
emergency management services, but over time, public safety ideas evolved to focus on the promotion of common good or public welfare, protection of citizens from any threat, or harm, or risk that would uh, adversely affect their health and uh, well-being. Next slide. The description of public safety consists of the following elements, the same basic requisites of general welfare that uh, are identified as enablers or instruments of uh, governance. So these are the elements of public safety. Then next slide. Why the interest of public safety uh, in counterterrorism? Uh, both public safety and uh, anti-terrorism are intertwined by the same uh, ends and values that we want to prevail for a peaceful society. So the, the law uh, mentioned about protection of life, liberty, and property to prevent, prohibit, and finalize terrorism, and terrorism as inimical and dangerous to public welfare. Terrorism as crime against people, humanity, and the law of uh, nations. So the anti-terrorism law, next slide, is challenged on various grounds. Uh, first of all, there is no internationally accepted definition of terrorism and uh, the oppositors uh, stated that uh, the definition is uh, overbroad, very extensive. Uh, but there are similarities in the elements and the requisites uh, despite of the more than 100 definition of terrorism. Issues such as uh, prescription or classifying and categorizing a group or an individual as a terrorist is one issue. Also surveillance and wiretapping, uh, the warrantless detention, the process of custodial investigation and interrogation, uh, the provision of torture or uh, coercion and uh, restriction on basic rights and fundamental freedoms and the perceived excessive powers given to the Anti-Terrorism Council. Uh, Sir Lawrence have uh, discussed uh, all of this and explained to us uh, these issues and challenges. Next slide. But this, despite of the overriding issue uh, propounded by individuals and groups, we also see in the, the law safeguards um, that are put in place in the provisions. Um, so we're only, uh, we are asking ourselves for whose benefit is the law? Is it intended to suppress or coerce or deny the enjoyment of fundamental freedoms? Or is it directed to a specific uh, terror aversive individuals and uh, organizations. Uh, we can only surmise and appreciate and even accept the perceived dysfunctions and the inadequacies of the, the law. But at the same time, ensure that these safeguards are uh, taken into consideration in the enforcement of the law and uh, in the realization of its uh, aspirations for the, for the intents and purposes for the welfare of our people. So this, uh, these, are, uh, these safeguards are uh, embedded in the law, uh, just uh, like uh, humanitarian exemption, judicial authorization, availability, security, and attestation of uh, the custodial lag book, Focus programs of the Anti-Terrorism Council, the uh, unlawful acts that are punishable, committed by law enforcement agent or military personnel, and the participation of the Commission on uh, Human Rights. Uh, next slide. So, why the jittery feeling or uh, perception? 
about the anti-terrorism law? Are we unduly affected by the sweeping notion of a global war on terror? Is it a knee-jerk response to some acts of terrorism in and outside of this country? We have also uh, seen some uh, expressions or statements about uh, the martial law of the police state. Uh, we cannot uh, deny that we have been into that uh, historical uh, period. And we have uh, heard about the experiences of those who were victims of uh, martial law regime. Is it like, is it a Tokhang uh, like uh, methodology? Although there may be a uh, misinterpretation of the real concept of the anti drug campaign strategy. Uh, red tagging of groups, for example, uh, um, red tagging IP schools, schools of uh, living tradition, or red flagging madrasa or uh, red tagging for the list Our uh, dissenters, how do we treat uh, this dissent in this country, for example? How can we air our grievances without being suspected or subject of surveillance or even intelligence operations? Or excessive or abuse exercise of authority in so far as the the powers that were granted to the anti-terrorism council. So what is our position if we are into advocacy and uh, interveners in our peace building and peacemaking uh, efforts? So this, uh, then next slide. We look at the law be very comprehensive and holistic, and not only an operational strategy or a counter-terrorism measure, but uh, it should involve an approach that is more acceptable to the people. And we can see this in the areas of focus programs by taking into consideration the root causes of terrorism, and even violence and conflict, and uh, utilizing such tools at conflict management and to address the roots of conflict and promoting, uh, by building state capacity and promoting equitable economic development. Uh, next slide. With this law, uh, does it mean that uh, the state is uh, criminalizing peace advocacy and activism and even militancy and radicalism or is it a, uh, an indicator of uh, a democratization? How does it de-radicalize the ranks of uh, extremists? Or for example, uh, red tagging a uh, a certain group or uh, prescribing a certain group and uh, how about if they consider it, is, it as a badge of honor and instead of the radicalization there are actually avenues of rare radicalization uh, there is always a class uh, not necessarily physical or but imaginary between state actors and armed groups operating outside of the law uh, what choice do we have? Uh, do we cling to the hard security approach or recognizing that the, the soft but progressive mechanism such as build, uh, peace building and continuous dialogue uh, at all levels of our communities and uh, institutions? Next slide.
how do we see uh, the anti-terrorism law as a counter-terrorism strategy uh, or a policy measure against uh, terroristic acts? Is it repressive or uh, restrictive of our basic rights and uh, fundamental freedoms? Uh, can we see uh, a synergy for productive and constructive engagement to open, to open avenues for convergence, dialogue, and conscientization? And uh, next, what can we do or share? It was emphasized by Sir Lawrence that this is not only a problem, this is not only an issue of the government, but all of us should be involved in uh, this engagement. Can we have, uh, can we involve ourselves in public uh, oversight or popular oversight? to put pressure on the uh, security sectors and law enforcement uh, agencies to implement the law in consideration of the basic rights and fundamental freedoms? Are we participating in community awareness and engagement and recognition that the issue is uh, real? And affects the, the, our daily lives and uh, of course uh, what grassroots interventions or in initiatives are present so that we can involve ourselves actively in this uh, engagement and the development of support systems and networks including conflict management or transformation and to strengthen the reporting uh, mechanisms for, uh, for violations and capacity, capacity building for non-violence and engaging with uh, all the, the parties involved. Uh, do we have uh, uh, neighborhood peace committees to discuss and tackle these, uh, confront the issues that are present in the light of the anti-tourism law? And do we have a higher understanding of uh, equity principles and social inclusion? So, next slide. So, how do we look at the approach? Do we securitize or secularize our uh, anti terrorism? strategy. Are we bent on reducing, neutralizing the security threats or promoting an environment of safety and protection so that we can have a, uh, we can ensure and promote community safety and well-being where justice rules, health and well-being of our people are primordial, peace and human rights prevail, Social cohesion and social integrity are foremost value. Next slide. Our trail ahead is to have a, uh, a holistic, efficient, effective, uh, acceptable uh, anti terrorism strategy that reflects the realities and context of our peculiar situation because uh, it is uh, our aspiration as a people that uh, just and lasting peace must prevail and continue to guide our uh, daily lives. That's all, thank you very much. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much. Thank you po ng Maraming Police Major General Cedric G. Trayen. Thank you, sir. At this point, may I now introduce our last speaker for this session. She hails from Butuan City, truly a Butuanan of mind and heart. She was the Dean of the Father Saturnino Urios 
University College of Law, serving in that capacity as dean for the last 15 years. During her deanship at FSUU College of Law, the Urian Legal Assistance Program or ULAP was established. ULAP is the first conflict sensitive, conflict transformative legal assistance program in the country with a special heart for the environment and the indigenous peoples of Caraga. She was also appointed by the Supreme Court as member of the Oversight Committee for the implementation of revised law student practice rule. She is a certified public accountant, elected national president of the Philippine Institute of Certified Accountants in 2012. And in the year 2014, she was elected as the Secretary General of the ASEAN Federation of Accountants. She is currently commissioner of the Legal Education Board. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Commissioner Josefe Sorelati. Hello everyone. Hi Father Michael. May maayong buntag sa inyong tanan. So may I share my screen? Yes ma'am, go ahead. Okay. So, my buntag sa tanan. Justice Felix Frankfurter of the United States Supreme Court said that the law is, in the last analysis, what lawyers are. And lawyers are what law schools make of them. This statement highlights the great importance of education on how our laws are crafted and legislated and implemented. Tweaking another saying, that of the hands that rock the cradle rock the world, we can say that the hands that form future lawyers form the world. Whatever are the strengths and shortcomings of our anti-terrorism law or Republic Act 11479, which took effect July of this year, reflects how the lawyers who helped craft and legislate this law were formed by the legal education system. And now I will make my caveat. This is my own personal opinion. Yes, I come from the legal education board, but this does not reflect the views of the office. This is my own personal opinion. A lot of commentaries and opinions have been said about the law. Some see it as a tool to stifle dissent and to settle political scores. Contrary to the declared policy of the law, which is to protect life, liberty, property from terrorism. Now, this was already explained by General Train a while ago. There is this laudable policy in the anti-terror law that is there to protect our life, liberty, and property. But people are saying, no, this law does not protect our life, liberty, and property. Well, if you read the law, it says it does. So, is this new anti-terrorism law for our protection or not? The declared policy, which is the spirit of the law, this is the spirit of the law that will guide everyone implementing the law, says that it was legislated to secure Filipinos from the harms of terrorism. But why the fear that the policy will not be realized? Is this new law more fearsome than its predecessor law, which is the Human Security Act or RA 9372? The determining factor under the Human Security Act, which defines terrorism, is the condition that the acts committed will sow and create condition of widespread fear and panic among the populace and would coerce the government to give in to an unlawful demand. Under the new anti-terror law, you look at that, that's what is flashed on the screen. These are the key elements, the conduct, and, and that this conduct or acts is there to create again, just like the Human Security Act, an atmosphere of fear to intimidate the government or any, the public or any organization. But in the element now, no, but in the new definition of terrorism, in the anti-terrorism law, there is a condition there that was not found in the Human Security Act, which for me gives me a little bit comfort 
although some would say this is not something that will give comfort, there is a condition there. And what is that condition? It says that the definition will not include advocacy, protest, dissent, stoppage of work, industrial or mass action, or other similar exercises of civil and political rights, which are not intended to cause death or serious physical harm to a person, to endanger a person's life, or to create a risk to public safety. If you look up the two laws, this is really the one that causes the difference, right? For me, wow, if you just look at the definition, this definition makes me a little bit comfortable because it has a condition. It says what are not terroristic act. In the previous law, this was not there. But then, why is there fear? Where is this fear coming from? In my personal opinion, the fear does not come from the law. Although uh, Congressman Lau already, I agree with Congressman Lau, there are several uh, acts that are criminalized there, like inciting to terrorism, uh, proposing terrorism. Not, we, uh, we're afraid because these are just, this could be done through words. Like when you propose these are words. So this might be, this might be used to curtail our freedom of expression. But uh, I see that the fear comes not from the law. It comes from how the law will be interpreted and implemented by the agents of the state and the members of the community. All of us, not just our police force, not just the judges, not just your prosecutors, who will be interpreting and implementing the law. In fact, the initial interpretation of the law will come from us, the lay citizen, because we will be the one to inform the enforcers, the police, aid, the agents of the state that here, here's somebody doing terroristic act. Come on, enforce the law. Diba? Kita mana. We will be the ones who would really ignite the implementation of the law through our own initial interpretation. Now, Will the agents of the state, as well as the members of the Filipino community, be able to interpret and implement the law for the common good? As what General Train said a while ago. Will that, well, the, these laws are really for the common good. Even this terrorism law, anti-terrorism law, is for the common good, for the general welfare. Will the agents of the state and the Filipinos be able to uphold the basic rights and fundamental liberties of the people as enshrined in the Constitution? in the implementation of the law. By the way, as also stated by General Train, this is a caveat, this is a condition under the law that in the implementation of the law, our basic rights and fundamental liberties that are enshrined in the constitution must be protected. That's in the anti-terror law. And so why the fear? Then we ask again, will the agents of the state and the Philippine nation have the political will and the capacity to take a comprehensive approach comprising of political, economic, diplomatic, military, and legal means in responding to terrorism. Can we do that? The law says we should, but can we do that? Do the Filipinos have conflict management and post-conflict peace-building capacities that address the roots of conflict as required by the law? The law said we must have those things. This is one, these are the things that we need to counter terrorism. But do we have that? The implementation of the anti-terror law is not just the concern of the state agents, but also of the whole community. It will be the state agents and the community who will define the contours of the implementation of the law. And I think that is where the fear is coming from. We are afraid. We are afraid that we will misinterpret the law. We, not just the agents of the state. We are afraid that we will not be able to say no to the wrong implementation of the law. I have seen a lot of laws that are vague and so broad, but have worked, worked in favor of the general welfare. Because the law is a living thing. We are the ones who would give life to the law. And the law's life will depend on how we interpret it and how we implement it. It seems that, how I, read, how, how I read this fear, that the Filipino as a whole lacks the capacity 
or lacks the confidence to interpret and implement the anti-terrorism law. The formation of an individual affects how an individual acts and thinks. The fear that is generated by the anti-terror law reflects a lack of confidence in the formation of the Filipinos. Education is one of the formative mechanisms of an individual. In fact, the International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which the Philippines agreed to and is bound to comply, declares that the goal of education is what? the full development of the human personality and the sense of its dignity and strengthening of the respect for human rights and fundamental freedom. We have signed this law in the 1970s. We know this from primary up to higher education. Supposed to be, we have already worked on developing the, the human personality. We have already inculcated a sense of dignity and we have already strengthened everybody who went through the educational system, the respect for human rights and fundamental freedom. Meaning, once they get out of school, they are people, we are people who know how to respect, how to fulfill, how to protect human rights and fundamental, fundamental freedom because that is the goal of education. And we have undertaken as a state that we shall pursue this goal when we educate every Filipino. All, did we remind while we were teaching, and I'm a teacher, okay, did we remind our students that human rights is irreplaceable in the, and indispensable to personal and collective development? Did we make them understand what human rights is? Did we remind our students that when we take away human rights, we are also taking away the essence of every individual, the humanity? You know, when we deny human beings their human rights, it's equal to denying them their humanity. Did we teach our policemen did we teach our lawyers? Did we teach our judges? Did we teach everybody, all of us, including us who would do the initial interpretation of the law, what human right mean? Because if we know what human right mean, when we interpret that anti-terror law, that's already there because that's our lens. The concern generated by the effectivity of the anti-terror law should move every stakeholder in the educational system to make human rights the center of every course and study. We wouldn't have been in this situation now if we had a strong, we were grounded on human rights. It must be an educational system that will teach students how to interpret and apply the human rights perspective in every thought and action. It must be a learning experience that will remind its students that human rights are inherent and in, in, in and inalienable people and that people will use any and all means at their disposal including violence if there is failure to respect protect and fulfill human rights during the 2019 legal education summit stakeholders of legal education were one in declaring that legal education is the tool for change legal education is not just a tool for making lawyers, but a tool for building a just and humane society. This declaration applies not only to legal education, but to the whole educational system. There must be a shift in paradigm in educating our students. Education must be transformed into an education that upholds every human being's human rights. If this is done, by the way, it's not yet late. And you'll say, what will happen to the policemen, to the judges, the prosecutors who are no longer in the educational system? By the way, education is lifelong. And we continue with our education. So all is not lost. If this is done, if we educate ourselves, we educate ourselves on what is really meant by respecting, protecting, fulfilling human rights, then the fear that the anti-terror law 
will be implemented to quell decent or to settle political score will be unfounded. For that matter, the fear that a law is passed to violate our basic rights and freedom will be grounded. Thank you, and I hope I was able to share something that would at least give additional food for thought. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Attorney T, for your presentation. Thank you, Father Michael. At this point, we shall like to have a 10-minute break before we go on with our panel discussion. So everyone, let's have a 10-minute break. And let's be back for the panel discussion. Thank you very much. See you in a moment.
welcome back to our third session for Mindanao Peace Studies Conference 6. Our session theme for today is Peace Building and the Anti-Terrorism Law Contributions and Continuing Challenges. We shall now proceed to give our speakers a chance to ask questions to each other or give additional input to the talks that they just presented. We have 30 minutes for this panel discussion. And so, dear speakers, who would like to start first? Let's start with the first speaker then, Congressman Fortun. Oh, thank you, Father Michael. Uh, I'm very thankful for this, uh, for the for this, uh, course. Uh, uh, indeed, the engagement of different voices no, on matters of uh, significance to our country is uh, very important. Uh, we found out that uh, we are one no, in our aspirations no, to achieve peace for Mindanao, not only Mindanao, but the entire country. Uh, there are questions no, about uh, uh, the manner by which the anti-terrorism law was passed. Uh, there are questions uh, about the content no, of the anti-terror law. Only recently, the uh, implementing rules and regulations that it came out, and still uh, we thought that uh, the IRR would in a way address you know, the issues that have been raised. But uh, other sectors, you know, other petitioners uh, are saying that uh, the IRR in fact even strengthened you know, uh, provisions uh, that might you know, that might result in the impairment of, of uh, human rights and basic freedoms. Uh, but again, uh, I just would like to say that uh, at the end of the day, what we really need is public support you know, for any measure or any uh, undertaking against terrorism uh, initiated by government. And it's important that uh, in taking these measures, uh, we have to engage public support. And if public, the public is doubtful about certain measures you know, like the anti-terrorism law, we might not be able to uh, solicit and engage that support. Thank you, sir. Um, Attorney T, please, your thoughts about this. Hey, I agree with Congressman Lau. We really need public support. And because, you know, when you try to, I, I've said a while ago, the law is a living thing. We are the ones who would give life to that. And so if there are, as, as Congressman Lau said, that the, I haven't really read, I read, I just read in passing the IRR. I only read the law that way. So I could not also uh, comment so much on the IRR. But if indeed the IRR has questionable provisions that in fact, there's already the fear that this law will uh, stifle dissent or will violate our freedoms, then if the IRR aggravates that fear and gives uh, already an avenue for abuses, no? then I think we, we are all in the education community, it would be that we are part of the public. And we are, I'm not saying that the public are not thinking, but we are supposed to be the thinking public. It's really our role to already start that conversation and make those, uh, make those uh, express no? our what we think about the IRR. It would be, thank you, Congressman Lau, for bringing up the IRR. Maybe this could be placed in every academic table, especially in the College of Law. If we could already start you know, getting to know the IRR and understanding the IRR, and we should, if there are questionable or dangerous provisions that aggravate the situation, then it's really time for us to think of creative ways to take this away from the IRR. Uh, the Supreme Court case is one example of a peaceful way of questioning this law. Why? It's a signal. Eh? Those who, who filed that case, it's just telling if ever there are really people who want to abuse this law that, hey, this law should not be there to take away our freedom. No. This law is there to really protect our lives. And so, also with the IRR, we should also do that. I hope that I could encourage the law students who are here to start studying this law. This could be a very good, the IRR, this could be a very good uh, subject matter for your clinical legal education program. And this could help, help the country, help all of us. Because 
there's nobody who has everything. We need the different voices on the table. Sir. Uh, sir, please turn on your microphone first, please. Yes, sir. Your thoughts about the presentation of your fellow presenters? Uh, I fully support no, the, the the reflection and the thoughts of uh, Dean uh, T and uh, Sir Kong Lawrence. Uh, I also understand the uh, the issues and the challenges, including the the fears and the apprehension of uh, a lot of people in so far as uh, the terrorism law is concerned. That's why uh, I agree with uh, them that we need to have a continuous uh, engagement on this, more especially uh, uh, the popular oversight, uh, because we uh, really need to understand the dynamics of uh, counter-terrorism and uh, the peace-building efforts. That's why I was uh, trying, uh, so I was asking, how do we see the anti-terrorism law as a uh, strategy or a policy measure against uh, terroristic acts? Uh, because the very strong opposition is on the area that is very repressive and restrictive of the basic rights and uh, fundamental freedoms. Uh, say, for example, uh, red tagging. I have seen this for myself. Uh, for example, uh, how do why are we red flagging, for example, uh, IP schools or schools for living tradition? Uh, because these are not uh, within the, the formal educational system. That's why when in the peace conference in Dabo, I was uh, advocating for mainstreaming, for example, of these uh, IP schools into the formal educational system. Because we cannot afford to let the, the, the pupils, IP, IPs to walk. Uh, more than 30 kilometers to just to reach the, the nearest uh, the school that are accredited by uh, DEPED. The same is true also with the red flagging the madrasa. Because we are always uh, alleging that uh, this haven or, uh, or a melting pot for uh, extremism or insurgency. Why don't we mainstream that into the formal educational system so that uh, so our pupils, our children can get their K-12 education by just attending those schools. It is like uh, empower, empower. I think uh, we, we need to do a lot of things on the grassroots level. And uh, that would put pressure on uh, the central authorities to really reflect and consider the, the feelings of uh, our people. And to understand uh, this, uh, the, the perception and the expectation of the, the people. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you, General Ryan, sir. Um, any other questions on the part of each speaker? Would any one of you would want to ask question for your fellow panel? Attorney Can I ask a question? Yes, so go ahead, General Train. General Train, when you yes, mean when you mean uh, you have to. Uh, like the IP schools that they should be mainstream, is that the word I forgot, uh, be part or integrated in the educational system. What does that mean, po, sir? I, yes, ma'am, no, because uh, there, was an, uh, there, was, uh, there is an effort no, to ban all of these schools, to ban the IP schools, to, you know, uh, suspecting the madrasa IP schools to be heaven for insurgency and extremism. And these are not uh, accredited uh, with the Department of Education. So that's why I was uh, advocating, uh, why can't we mainstream this in the formal educational system where uh, our children can just stay there in these uh, IP schools for living tradition and in the madrasa and can they get their K-12 education instead of, uh, because these are community schools, these are community schools and are, uh, very progressive avenues for uh, teaching values. Uh, for example, the DepEd are hiring uh, teachers on uh, Arabic uh, language and uh, 
values education, but they're just staying in the schools, why not uh, deploy them in the communities or uh, madrasas at first? So that's and what happened in, for example, in Surigao or in uh, Sarangani, where the schools were closed. So, saan pupunta yung mga, mga kabataan mag-aral? Kasi nakikita ko ito na kiti re-rentag natin o re-rentag natin itong mga schools na ito. Mga community schools na ito. What, what can we do siguro? That's what I'm trying to emphasize po mga. Okay, thank you po, sir. Any other question from our panel? Kung wala na, then we shall now proceed with the open forum. And let me begin by asking some questions from our participants. For the open forum, the Zoom participants may write their questions in the chat box. And for those of you who are following us through FB Live and YouTube Live, you may write your questions in the comment section as well. And that will be forwarded to the moderator and the facilitator. And so the first question that I would want to read is coming from our one of our participants from Albert Putong. And the question is, and this is addressed to all the, per, the, the panel presenters, how can we ensure? How can we ensure that educational institutions can be a safe space or platform for academic discussions on matters of public importance? How can we ensure that educational institutions can be a safe space for academic discussions on matters of public importance? And who would like to answer that first? Maybe General Traen would like to answer that first, sir. Okay. Salamat po. Uh, I think that question is very you know, relevant. No? Uh, there are a lot of schools that are complaining because they are subject of uh, surveillance and uh, intelligence operations and that their uh, students, uh, student leaders are uh, being uh, suspected of uh, sympathizing or supporting or promoting uh, terrorism. But, uh, you know, I, for one, uh, uh, believe that uh, General Train, sir, we seem to have lost the uh, signal with Most especially our young people. They should, you uh, know, they should involve in uh, decision making because this anti-terrorism law is not only about uh, terrorists, but this affects our daily lives. So, so especially our, our young people who are in the school should uh, discuss this openly uh, without being uh, fearful of uh, survey, uh, subject of surveillance. That's why, uh, from the public safety sector, we have a lot of uh, lesson. Uh, le we have learned a lot of lessons from the past. And uh, I think you cannot expect now a public safety officer, a police, uh, to just uh, violate uh, the human rights. Because it's, even in our operational procedures, that's the, always the number one coordinating instruction that uh, full respect to human rights must be given the primary consideration in any police operations. But of course, we, can, we, can also, we cannot deny the fact that there are also violations. You know? and, uh, but I think we should get involved ourselves. Unless otherwise, we cannot conscientize uh, the basic idea of peace building human rights as it relates to counter terrorism. We don't discuss this openly. You know? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Congressman Fortun, sir. Uh, th that's really a challenge, no, in the light of the anti terror law. Uh, wh while, as a, as a Commissioner Jojo cited no, sa, uh, earlier, uh, the, the law in its definition of terrorism has excluded certain acts no? as, uh, as acts of terrorism. Uh, the, the law says that uh, uh, advocacy, protest, dissent, uh, mass action are not considered terrorism if they do not, uh, uh, if they are not intended to cause death or serious physical harm. But that's what the anti-terror law says. 
Why, but however, while the, 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 the definition tells us that there are certain acts no, that are not considered uh, acts of terrorism, uh, further in the law, there's a provision that says speeches, writings, proclamations, emblems, banners, and other representations tending to incite terrorism are already acts of terrorism. So you have here a definition that says that certain acts are not terrorism, but uh, late, uh, in the Further in the law, it says that certain speeches, writings, and proclamations uh, that tend to incite terrorism are terroristic acts. No? So, so you have your uh, varying, uh, varying provisions that really are not uh, consistent with each other. Now, as uh, Attorney Jojo said, uh, it, is, it now lies heavily no, on our implementers, no? uh, how they would appreciate uh, certain acts. Uh, but this is a great challenge on the part of uh, institutions because uh, uh, in the light of these uh, provisions uh, in the anti-terror law, uh, you would really have a hard time you know, distinguishing you know, uh, which one is not terroristic, uh, which one is not a terrorist act, which one is, not, uh, which one is a terrorist act because of the ambiguity of the provision. But uh, I think it's important for educational institutions, universities, colleges, you know, to encourage and foster freedom of speech freedom of expression and dissent inside the campus. Uh, only recently we found out that uh, there are schools until now that uh, curtail uh, uh, student journalism. Even in Metro Manila, there are schools that do not allow uh, uh, school paper. You know? uh, and that is, that is very alarming. I think uh, yes. it's important that uh, schools should encourage students you know, to come out in the open and uh, give them avenue for expression and uh, expression and dissent, you know, even uh, petition government for redress of grievances. These are constitutionally enshrined, uh, uh, guaranteed, these are constitutionally guaranteed uh, freedoms and, and, and rights that the schools should promote. You know. Thank you. Attorney T. Okay. The, uh, uh, Congressman Fortune was right. There is indeed a conflict. And I think what should be done first on the enforcer side, those who are doing surveillance on law schools or any school for that matter, I hope that they, the, these agencies could also be uh, capacitated to always remember that when there's a conflict, you resolve the conflict always in favor of upholding the human right of that person that you are suspecting or that's the students that you are suspecting. Always that. And that the evidence that you have, if you think is doing that student or that school is, uh, is what is encouraging terrorism, is that you must have enough, really, an abundance of evidence to prove that indeed there is, there are terrorism acts. You know, done by the school or by the student. I hope that frame of mind is there. And I hope that this is really very clear to all of those who are tasked in doing surveillance. And for the school, for the school, I believe, uh, for, the for the legal education board, I can speak for that. In the during this pandemic, what we really emphasize is that we have to, first and foremost, it's always the rights of the students that we have to protect. No, that because they are the most vulnerable in the educational system. Who's the most vulnerable? It's the students. So you really have to uphold their rights, even in the pandemic, our pandemic guidance. And I know all, also there is terrorism law. It will always be to uphold the right of the student. And so also for law schools, we, for schools, that should be the perspective. Our perspective in everything is always to uphold our the students' rights because they have been given to us to take care of them. So dapat ka na good. And then what do we do? Put up protocols. Put up protocols that will uh, safeguard our student from being branded or red tag. And you said, nako baka sasabihin, wag na mag journal, wala nang mga journal, wala na journalism. No. You sit as a community. This is really where, you know, when we have issues, I always go to consultation. Let's sit as a community. Let's talk as a community in this school and let's level off. Let's talk what are our fears because one school's fear might not be the same as the other schools. We contextualize. I mean, now I remember. In the IRR, there's a 
portion there that says, when you evaluate all this act, it must be, the context must always be, the context is very important. The person saying it is very important. They have also parameters there. And so also with schools, you have to sit down with your student, with your faculty, and make protocols, make programs and projects to help, not to stifle. Ha? Basi na po, gawas na tagpalisi nga, di na pwede mag-rally, di na pwede. No, that's not what I am talking about. But we talk and discuss this. There will never be a strict guidelines what to do and not to do. It will depend on the situation of that school, of that student. And secondly, we are teachers. We are facilitators. Eh? We are facilitators of learning. Let's enhance our capacity to facilitate learning. To, not to tell our student to do that or that. No, facilitate learning. We facilitate how they will learn what are those acts that they shouldn't do and those acts that they should do. That's very hard. But I think we just have to start thinking about that and working towards that. So that's at my end. Thank you very much. I shall now entertain another question. And the question is coming from, the question is actually coming from, where is the question? From one, one of our FB participants and the, from Cheat Assis of PPV Arcaraga. How can peace advocates and workers work effectively if they are subject to red tagging? Anybody who would like to answer that question? And I, they can never be, I know, say, uh, of course, they can never work well. Kaya nga, if we could, we can talk to our enforcers, to our implementers, we can request that uh, they also have to take into consideration that when you red tag, you place an obstacle to peace. You place an obstacle to wonderful things that could be done. No, It's really chilling red tagging. So if we could work on this, I, this is one matter that we should work on. And maybe we can talk. I always, I'm always, uh, I always believe that we talk, government, and the civil society should talk peacefully about this big issue on red tagging. We should talk and sit down because we only have one country. Let's take, take care of this country. We cannot be uh, fighting each other. We have to sit down and talk about red tagging. Anyone else who would like to comment to that or add to that? Yes, uh, I think it's really very important no, that uh, in the implementation of the anti-terrorism law. Uh, preservation of rights that are key to civil society should be primordial. Uh, civil society has been uh, an important partner, not only of government, but uh, of, uh, of different sectors in, in creating conditions no, in the communities uh, that uh, will empower people. And uh, this prevents uh, the, the, the rise of circumstances that uh, make uh, terrorism thrive. And if civil society's uh, movement you know, and participation is hampered of restrictive uh, laws you know, that affect their freedom of expression, uh, freedom of association, and freedom of assembly, we contain the civil society's role no, as important partners in quelling terrorism at its roots. We have always emphasized that uh, uh, on top of uh, military and law enforcement solutions, uh, there's a need to address the ills, you know, the social ills that, uh, uh, that uh, breed terrorism. And civil society has been in the forefront you know, of these efforts. So, so major chilling, it, it, it's uh, essentially effect on democratic space if uh, red tagging happens uh, here and there. You know? uh, for example, in our case, you know, uh, I belong to the minority in the House of Representatives. In that minority, we have uh, uh, members of party list organizations that have been branded as, a, as terrorist organizations already. So parang, parang pati ikaw, parang you don't want to be associated only with your, 
your colleagues in the minority because of fear that you might be red tagged as well. No? So uh, dapat, uh, there should be a holistic uh, framework no? uh, in assessing uh, organizations and individuals before designating them as terrorists or terrorist groups. So that's why uh, na, uh, that's why we really wanted na sana na napasadahan ng mas maayos yung provisions uh, so that we could have addressed no uh, ambiguity of provisions that might result in, in the impairment of basic rights and uh, freedoms. Uh, however, we were not given that opportunity because uh, it was really quite a very accelerated uh, process in the house. No, uh, imagine. Uh, uh, an anti-terror bill that supposedly supersedes the previous Human Security Act being passed by the committee in less than two hours. Uh, th that's quite irregular, no? And while we know that the intention of the, of the proponents no, of this measure uh, are good, but the manner by which it was passed in the legislature creates doubts. No, already not only on the part of us no, who are part of the legislature, but creates doubts on the part of the public. And when you are not able to solicit that support from the public, uh, your efforts against terrorism uh, might be stalled, no? might, might, uh, might be weakened. Because when there's not uh, public support, mahina uh, yung uh, uh, participation, especially in the local communities where terrorism thrives. Yes, General Krain, sir. The uh, civil society has, is a key element in the in the strategy, actually, and in peace building. Uh, and first, uh, the, the advocates, the advocates uh, must also establish their credibility uh, in the law. While there is a humanitarian exemption, there is no system of recognition of. Uh, Peacemakers, peace builders. No? While we, there is also a, uh, a provision on proscription, but we don't have a system of recognition of uh, those people who are uh, actively involved in peace building efforts. That's why uh, sometimes they will be just be suspected of being sympathize, sympathizers or supporters. There is also a provision on blacklisting, no? on proscription. But it's more difficult uh, because we don't have the standards for delisting. Uh, because we have uh, experience in the anti-drug operations. You were already dead, but you're still in the list. So there must be, uh, I agree with uh, Mandin Jojo about uh, the standards and the protocols that we follow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, one question is addressed to the three of you as lawyers and the question is she asks as lawyers this is from an anonymous attendee she asks as lawyers would you say that the proper enforcement of the law is the best way to promote and keep peace in short will there be peace if laws are properly implemented um I was, you know, uh, in my presentation, I was asking about uh, the hard security approach or is there any chance for uh, progressive uh, avenues to resolve all uh, these issues? Do we really need to securitize everything? Because in public safety, I, uh, we do not really agree with the securitization of uh, public safety. We, we want our communities to get involved. We want to popularize. We want to secularize the, the, the public safety idea so that the people themselves uh, are co-owners of uh, peace and uh, order in their communities. Anyone else? Uh, uh, for Father Michael, you know, enforcement is not an easy task. And you can only have proper enforcement if you also have capacitated enforcers. Who knows that enforcement does not just mean following the law literally. No, literally. Uh, you must have, you know, now the 
the Supreme Court has uh, issued the law student practice rule that already mandates clinical legal education program to, uh, in all law schools. Why? Because there is a realization that students are so much good in theory, they could not apply it to the context. That's the problem with our enforcement. We, we are so incapacitated in contextualizing the law. Tapos sabihin, ay, so relative pala ang law. Hindi naman ganun eh. Even that eh, what do you mean by contextualizing? Meaning relative, kung ang nangawat pobre, okay. Kung ang nangawat dato, di okay. Di ba? Even that, we, we do not know. How will we know if we do not practice that in school? We do not teach that or we do not facilitate the learning. I agree, proper enforcement is the key. And of course, the bottom, the underlying ano dyan, is that the law is also a just law. Because there can be laws that are not just. So even if you properly enforce the law, if the law is unjust, wala pa rin. So una gidana is that it must be a just law. Then you enforce it. How to enforce it? Oh my God, that's very, very challenging. And we have to capacitate. In enforcing, that's already applying theory to practice. Eh? And that is what I see. That is what I see in us. We are having a hard time uh, uh, applying what we learn to the, to the realities, the present reality. In the words, I think, of Tony Meloto is, hindi tayo nakalanding. Nandun pa rin tayo sa hangin. Naging ulumulutang-lutang. So, yes, it, proper enforcement is uh, is the right way to go, but of course, that as also as is this a just law that we are enforcing? Uh, I I agree entirely with uh, Commissioner John. No, no, na, na it really uh, lies on the orientation, on the mindset of the enforcer. Uh, the enforcer's bias no should be. Uh, towards the declare towards the policy of the law. Uh, if you notice, uh, kung tanaw na mga balaho, there's always a declaration of policy at the first part of the law before the more uh, specific provisions. Because the declaration of policy uh, more or less tells us the spirit of the law. Now, for example, in the case of the anti-terror bill, yes, it's true that it gives us some comfort that it says in the declaration of policy that the intent of the law is to preserve and protect uh, the right to life, liberty, and property. But again, we are worried that there are provisions in the law that might threaten no, uh, the right to life, liberty, and property. So in the course of the implementation, if the enforcer, uh, the enforcer's bias is on the spirit of the law, no, he would tend to uh, enforce the law in the light of the declaration of policy. So that if, uh, the enforcement results in the impairment of right to life, liberty, and property. That would be a wrong enforcement of the law. So, dapat ganun yung tingin eh. Yung bias should not be uh, should not be towards personalities, towards organizations, or towards ideologies. For example, um, we land reform as an issue uh, is uh, advocated by many sectors, many organizations, even moderates, no, uh, or even uh, student leaders, for instance, uh, think that there should be equal distribution of wealth no, to address poverty. Now, leftist organizations also advocate land reform. Now, when you engage in speeches, writings, no, and proclamations that uh, promote and assert uh, land reform, similar to that uh, asserted by uh, organizations that are branded as terrorists. What happens to you now? Is your speech uh, an act that tends to incite terrorism? No. How does the law enforcers now look at this and appreciate this? Arrestuhin ka ba? Sasabihin na you are inciting terrorism. No. So again, uh, this uh, goes back no, to your appreciation of the law. Na you are not going to to enforce it based on the letter, but enforce it based on the policy declared by the law itself. But uh, it's better sana na, na all the provisions contained in the law should be consistent with the declaration of policy so that there will be not much doubt on the part of the enforcer how to enforce the law. But again, if there are ambiguities, 
uh, dapat ang enforcer kay Balusian what to embrace the letter or the spirit thank you thank you very much at this point so, i'll i'll forward you now to our facilitator who shall present the questions from our fb live and youtube participants engineer asura please thank you father michael we have a question from june lasaga in the mindset of a law enforcer it is our collective duty to end violence against civilian communities those groups who are sowing terrorism in the likes of communist communist terrorist group that impedes development across the land. That is why this legislator is crafted ATA 2020 to quell it. The government is also under threat by terrorism. Why are we so afraid? What? Why are we so afraid of this? I think this is addressed to any of the speakers. May, may I may I respond? Okay. Yes. Uh, the question of my fraternity brother, Jun Lasaga. Uh, we should look at the, uh, the history of the country you know, from that perspective. We've been through a lot of uh, human rights violations. Uh, we were under martial law for several years. You know, and uh, that experience cannot be simply forgotten. We, after martial law, still human rights violations continue to happen. And uh, uh, even now, you know, uh, it's not only uh, under Cory Aquino's time, you know, even after Cory Aquino, the administration that supposedly replaced a dictatorship, human rights here and there happen. Uh, now, extrajudicial killings here and there happen, and uh, we still don't know how uh, these are being investigated and uh, so far uh, these have not been resolved and so you have there uh, a situation that that uh, creates fears no, on the part of the people so do we not welcome an anti-terrorism law of course we welcome an anti-terrorism law and we commend you know, the efforts of our uh, law enforcers you know, the members of the afp the pnp for their for their sacrifices you know, to preserve peace and order in the country. But what we've been saying is that uh, at the core of anti-terrorism policies, strategies and efforts should be the preservation and protection of fundamental rights and freedoms. As uh, we said, the Declaration of Policy says that uh, right to life, liberty and property are supposed to be protected. In the course of the implementation, uh, this should not be hampered or impaired. Otherwise, we defeat the essence of the law. We are not afraid of anti-terrorism and of the anti-terrorism law. We want an anti-terrorism law. We want to quell terrorism. We want to work together, no? And that's why, because we want to work together, we want to engage the public to participate in these efforts. But if the public doubts the policies and strategies taken by government because of the fear that they, they this might uh, uh, curtail their uh, basic freedoms and rights. How can we work together you know, towards a common end to end to the system? So let's engage the public. Uh, let's have them support us in these efforts. And uh, in so doing, let us make them trust our policies. And in order to do that, engage them in consultative processes when we craft legislations. In this case, it was uh, quite uh, uh, very fast. No? And even in the House, uh, there was not much deliberations on the issue. Okay, thank you, Congressman Fortune. Yes, um, uh, General Train. Jun Lasaga was asking about uh, why are people afraid of the law? Uh, I would like to say that, you know, the, the uh, apprehension of people uh, are based on realities, uh, as uh, emphasized in the presentation. But more than the perception of fear, I think this is more of a challenge to our uh, public safety, uh, the security sectors, to establish their credibility, to abide with the standards and to comply with the, the operational procedures and to strictly enforce the law. 
in consideration of uh, the basic rights and fundamental freedoms. We don't need, uh, we also have to, to consider the perspectives of the people so that we can implement the law uh, and enforce it, the provisions, uh, consideration of the, the, the basic principles why this law was uh, um, enacted. And, uh, you know, uh, there are still uh, petitions in the Supreme Court of, uh, on the constitutionality of the law. So we have also to build consensus with the people, understand how they feel, and uh, do our job uh, properly and strictly. Yun lang po. Okay, thank you, General Chayin. Okay, we have also another question here from a YouTube. Uh, we have from Ia Elmido, what are the things that may cause a person to be called a terrorist under the anti-terrorism law? Anybody can answer the question? Any of the our panelists can answer the question. What are the things that may cause a person to be called a terrorist under the anti-terrorism law? That's a very difficult question. I can read. I can read the definition, but you know that's very simplistic by reading the definition. And in fact, discussing what are the acts would need another session. Would need another session because mm -hmm. I'm afraid if I'll just read this and you'll get the wrong notion. Ang hirap eh. That is why nga, there is already a case in the Supreme Court because some people are saying it is ambiguous. But let me read because. By the way, there is really no correct, wrong definition of terrorism. If you look at terrorism, all the definitions, uh -huh. my God. There, but there are two elements there. It's the conduct and the purpose. No, The conduct in our law, the conduct really is what? Uh, like if you uh, harm somebody, destroy a very important installation or services in the government or private property, uh, that would, no, and there are other acts for under, that would, what? Uh, create an atmosphere or spread message of fear that would provoke or influence, no? By intimidation, the government or any international organization or seriously destabilize or destroy the fundamental political, economic, or social structures of the country or create a public emergency or seriously undermine public safety. Maugali na usay magtinunto sila eh. Will the virus be an act of terrorism kasi it na it came to the Philippines and it's causing uh, fear, atmosphere of fear, yo, no? So that's uh, the definition. Indeed it's true it's very broad and that's where the that's where the court cases come, no? The role of court cases since I'm the lawyer. That's where court cases come because in court cases, when there's already a case, no, that is there, that's you gave the, you give the Supreme Court the opportunity to already interpret the law. What does it really mean when you apply already this definition to an actual situation? But as of now, I can give you a book definition. You can go to section four. That is what anti-terrorism is. If you really want to apply it, let's have another session for that because this is a very very very, very uh, important uh, topic that we cannot just talk like uh, in a few minutes or an hour. No? Yeah. Thank you, Attorney T. So we still have one question from Dino Pineda. This is a Facebook question. Why is the burden being passed on schools to prove that they are innocent? Imagine just one law, one very problematic law and schools have to prove their innocence every time? What happened to innocent innocent unless proven guilty? Uh, anybody can answer? Any of the panel reactors? Uh, Dino, I want, Dino, there's nothing in the law that, that tells us that we are already uh, guilty. There's not, nothing in the law that says that. I think it's just the impression that uh, we have, is that did you get did you is that question coming from what I said we make protocols? That's why you 
said, no, I'm just saying to safeguard our students, to make things peaceful, to make them comfortable. It doesn't mean that protocols are there because we are already being tagged as terrorists to, uh, that uh, schools are breeding down. No, I'm just saying to make things comfortable, to make people secure because we are in fear. Eh? I don't know where this fear is coming from. Sometimes I believe in that saying na you put down, there are ants inside a bottle. Eh, yung ants, pag you just leave it at that, hindi nag-aaway, shake the ant, nag-aaway yan. I know what, that's how I see the situation now. We're at each other's throat because somebody is trying to generate a lot of, what I don't know, conflict out of this law. And we should not be tempted. In fact, we should sit down. Fear? Life will always have fear. That question on fear, and some people say I'm utopia. No, it's just a reality. There's always fear in everything. We embrace that fear. How do we embrace the fear? We talk about that fear. And I hope the enforcers will also sit down and talk with us. Do you know there's nothing in the law that says that we have to, we, have, we are now, we have to, to, uh, to, to prove our innocence. Wala naman sa law eh. Wala naman. I hope, I don't know from where you're coming from. But baka you said it's because of the protocol. No. The protocol is not because to prove that our innocence. No. Government still has to prove that we are guilty. Even when the, on that warrantless arrest, they have to prove. And if they're mistaken, they can be held liable for that. The law also says that. So why are these this measures there? Because the law is signaling, telling, Hoy, kayo dyan na nag-aarrest, ingat kayo. Kasi it's still the right, the, everybody must be presumed innocent. Magkamali kayo, nako, kayo yung kawawa. So there's nothing in the law that says that we are not presumed innocent. Thank Sorry, you. Ha, I'm very, very, uh, yeah. very, very, what passionate. <laughs> Thank you, Ma'am Jo. Thank you, Attorney. Okay, you know, yes, uh, for General Jain. Yes. From the practical point of view, uh, I just want to be proactive. Yung tulad sa, ano, just like uh, in the drug uh, campaign strategy, yung watch list, mm. you, you don't even know. Okay, General Train. Hello. I think uh okay. in that Okay, I think General Train, yes sir. I think you have an intermittent signal right now. that's Yeah. Hello, sir. Hello. So we will, we will just go back to General Tain if he has a good signal. Uh, we will continue. This would be the last of the FB questions that was that will be addressed to any of the panelists. This is from Ralph Mankau. Uh, if we are to see communal responsiveness and responsibility on the anti-terrorism law, how can stakeholders encourage participation from the least informed, specifically the IPs isolated in the hinterland communities who are more prone to terrorist incitement? Yes. I, Ralph, you can answer that. You're in ULAP. You better do something about that. No, we have to take action, all of us. And for the law students, that is also one of the reasons why the, the student law practice rule was passed. We really have to help each other, especially at this time. There's so much fear. For you at ULAP, you better start with your legal orientation. Because, you know, fear, what's the... Ta ang say tambal sa fear. What's the medicine of fear? It's knowledge. Eh. So that's part of your CLEP, your clinical legal education program. You start going up there and teach them. And... And, and, and teach them. And at the same time, we, are, we shouldn't also be naive that abuses will not come in. Be prepared for abuses. And so you capacitate yourself in ULAP. You already start studying the anti-terrorism law. You already start how you can immediately file a case in court to protect the rights of those who will be abused by this law. So Ralph, I'm throwing that uh, question back to you. 
what should you do? You know what you should do. You're a student of the law. You know, I love the law because the law always gives you a lot of assistance. It's all there, the menu. Sorry, Ralph, putting the, <laughs> the burden on your shoulder. But sige, those are the things that you should do na in ULA. Pa, legal orientation and you better start preparing na format, ano, petitions format that you can immediately file if ever there is somebody being abused by the law so that you can protect the life and liberty of that somebody. Thank you, Attorney T. So can I can we go back now to uh, General Train? As, as I was, uh, as what I have uh, said, uh, in the case of, uh, uh, I'm just proactive. Uh, oh, yes. How can, how can we know that uh, state actors or security actors uh, would have a watch list, just like in the, the drug uh, watch list, for example? And uh, nobody knows that his, uh, his or her name is in that watch list. So that's, that's actually one issue, and that's a, a cause of fear uh, and apprehension. I think uh, we need to uh, develop some standards on this, and that standards will be very transparent. Just like, uh, because, you know, if you say classify, that's uh, an intelligence uh, nomenclature, no? looking and uh, categorizing people, you know, designating them as... Uh, Supporters, sympathizers, active uh, or providing material support, you know, a lot of uh, categories. Okay, sige. Thank you, General Tain, for that. Uh, may I turn you over again to our moderator, Father Michael. Thank you, Ma'am Sen. One final question, this time coming from myself, the moderator. <laughs> okay. I, I On Section 14, the uh, 45 of the Anti-Terror Act of 2020, Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, there is a provision there um, uh, uh, that discusses the that discusses the causes for the spread of terrorism. In the IIR as well, in Rule 39, 3.9, and uh, particularly on that last paragraph after Section D, it mentions that in that the anti-terror council and should be creating programs for the preventing and countering of violent extremism and should be doing programs as well for the prevention and the combating of terrorism and, and as defined in this act. And it mentions specifically that the religious sector should be involved and should be actively consulted in this program. So coming myself from the religious sector, um, how would you suggest that this be, how could we go about with this? Again, this is, uh, this is you talking to us religious on the prevention of extremism and in the prevention of terrorism. Anyone of you? Essentially, what is the role of the church that should be doing about this or the churches and the religious sector in general father you provide a platform we, we will be starting to discuss our fears everything what is the fear of the butuan city community and the diocese of butuan on this anti-terror law because fear would vary from place to place and so the, the church has to take care of its flock so maybe may i suggest that our next activity will already be uh uh consultation or a dialogue between all the different actors in this anti-terrorism law where the, the, uh, the church, the diocese will uh, facilitate this uh, dialogue. My, my suggestion, Father. General Train, sir. What is this impacts on the role of the church and on the religious organization on, the, on education? And I, and I agree with... Uh, Mambin, Jojo, that uh, we should provide a platform for dialogue and, and engagement. And uh, on a more higher uh, level of uh, spirituality dimension of uh, our the, the strategy on peace building, human rights, and terrorism. Thank you very much. Thank you.
finally a turn uh, as congressman for Tun. Uh, Father Michael, this is one of the many provisions of the anti-terror law that are commendable. No, uh, when, when I voted against the anti-terror bill, uh, I did not vote against the entire bill. No, I was worried about certain provisions. But if you look at the entire law, uh, there are really provisions that are really uh, very commendable and uh, worth our support. And one of these is the uh, Section 45 that uh, encourages the participation of different sectors in these efforts. No, and uh, I think. Uh, you have been doing that already. This Mindanao Peace Studies uh, Conference no, is very important, no, especially in engaging different voices uh, in our efforts no, to, to, to achieve no, lasting peace in Mindanao. So uh, yes, I agree that, uh, that the church should provide the platform. And, uh, uh, and uh, I, I think uh, because this is in the provision, this is in the law, uh, other provisions of the law that might be inconsistent with Section 45 should be revisited. No, as I was saying, maganda yung batas in its entirety. No, but there are provisions that are worrisome, and these provisions no, should not uh, defeat the other provisions that are very important in our fight against terrorism. Thank you very much. With that, we now ask all of you for your final messages, for your closing messages for this session. Maybe 30 minutes at most for each of you. <laughs> Seconds, I mean. Yes, let me start from maternity. Okay. Oh, my message is that uh, there is fear, and we have to embrace that fear. Part of embracing that fear is starting to sit down and talk about that fear and look for ways to lessen that fear because the world is not perfect. I cannot tell you that once that we will find a solution to curb any or to prevent any abuses to this law. There will be abuses, but we just hope not that much. And so all of us must be prepared for that. General Tain, sir. What can I say? Thank you very much, uh, of course, to the organizing committee. Uh, sir Kong Lawrence, uh, Ma'am Dean Jojo, and to all the participants for your indulgence in uh, listening to us. Uh, our request for peace is, uh, is a long and arduous and uh, very difficult and complex. But uh, let us persevere as always. Uh, let us make ourselves centers of gravity in our uh, journey for a just and lasting peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Finally, Congressman Fortun, sir. Yes, yeah, Father Michael. I think the, the issue on the anti-terror uh, law should not be a cause for quarrel no, among uh, sectors of our society. That should be a reason for sitting down for a dialogue and discourse. And I think it's important that the government engage you know, civil society and local communities and listen from their experiences and insights. Uh, it's important that when we craft legislations, it should be a product of consultative and inclusive processes so that when we implement the law, we have the unequivocal support of the public. We will always have uh, successes in our efforts if there is public support. And in order to do that, we involve the public in our processes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to each of our panel members. So palakpakan nato silang tanan gihapon, even if this is a virtual clap for all of you. So we have today we have this us that essentially public support is needed for the prevention of and for the support of the anti-terror efforts that we do. Second, that we welcome all the actions that should be promoting peace without, but at the same time supporting and assuring that the respect for fundamental human rights and fundamental freedoms are upheld. Number three, in our public safety, that there should be proper and strict enforcement of the law, and at the same time, assuring once more that fundamental rights and freedoms are not hampered. And finally, we educate and, and inculcate to people as educators the basic understanding of human freedom and 
basic human rights in order for us to move on with our journey in a life of peace and of happiness together. I now read the Certificate of Appreciation for our speakers. Certificate of Appreciation is presented to our presenters, to Attorney Josefe Sorera T for the invaluable service and contribution as presenter of the session on peace building and the anti-terrorism law contribution and continuing challenges during the Mindanao Peace Studies Conference 6 with the team Peace for Mindanao in the New Normal. Give his 24th day of November 2020 at the Father Saturno U.S. University, Butuan City, Philippines, signed by Gunil Roof, the principal advisor of UCAP, of the Deutsche Gesellschaft for International, Sutsame Narbait, Dankeschön, and for Reverend Father, signed by Reverend Father Randy Jasper, OGHTHD, the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Research of this university, and signed by the Reverend Father John Christian Uyang, President of Father Saturnino, Orios University. And now I turn you over to our session facilitator, Engineer Asura. Okay, thank you to our presenters, Honorable Lawrence Fortun, retired Police Major General Cedric Twain, and Attorney Josef Esorera T. Thank you as well to all participants from varied sectors of the society. Okay, thank you to our presenters, Honorable Lawrence Fortun, retired thank you very Police. Much. Major General Cedric Train and Attorney Josef Sorelli. Thank you as well to all participants from various sectors of the society. So before we end our session, we would like to invite everyone to this afternoon session with a theme, Youth Leadership and Social Media in the Context of COVID-19. Our panelists are Attorney Ernesto Neri, Attorney Liza Masuhod Alamia, Honorable Doña Crescencia Tesoro and Alfonso Tomas Atom Arroyo. To receive your certificate of participation, please answer the evaluation through the QR code and link shared in the chat box and in the comment section for the FB Live participants. The QR code or link will also be shown on the screen. That ends the third session of the Mindanao Peace Studies Conference 6. Once again, we would like to acknowledge the lead partners of Mindanao Peace Studies Conference 6, Father Saturnino Urius University, and Doce Geshevcha for International Susan Minerbait. Thank you everyone for your active participation. We hope to see you in this afternoon session. God bless okay. everyone. See you.